Hey guys, today I am going to be working on a Samsung console top dryer that will not heat. We're going to go over all the major components in this dryer to see what's wrong and try to get it back up and running. So if you need one specific part rather than the whole redo, we should show the timestamps in this, as well as individual videos for like the uh, high limit thermostat and the element itself. So if you need that specific part, just uh, skip ahead. Otherwise, we're going to tear this whole machine apart and show you exactly how to do it. It's not hard, but it is time consuming because you have to take the whole thing apart to get it done. However, you only need uh, two main components or tools to do this. Uh, first one's going to be this uh, nine in one screwdriver I got from Amazon. Uh, it's er called Irwin and it is freaking amazing. You can do a lot of different washers and dryers just with one uh, screwdriver. It's really nice, and then I got a putty knife on the other side, and you need that to open up the machine on, from the front. You can actually just use the screwdriver to open it up from the back, but it's a little bit easier from the front, but we're gonna show you how to do both. So let's get your uh, dryer back up and running as quick as possible. Before we begin, it's worth noting that the installation procedures for this Samsung dryer are almost exactly the same for both LG and Kenmore dryers that look similar to this one. So if you have a dryer that looks similar, chances are this will work too. Before you begin, make sure to unplug the dryer from the wall or turn the breaker off to the dryer, whichever is easiest for you. First, to remove the top of the dryer, you can use a putty knife to depress two tabs on the dryer to open the lid. However, the amount of space that these style dryers have, they may not let you do it, or the clips could be too stiff to allow you to open them up. In this case of the video, I failed at it, so I decided to open up the top the alternate way from the back. On the back of the dryer, two screws hold the top of the unit on. Unscrew them and you'll be able to push the lid of the dryer forward to allow it to lift upwards. Once the lid is opened up, you'll want to make sure to reinstall the screws so that you can lean the lid behind the unit. Otherwise, the lid could fall off and end up hanging just by the main board wires and potentially damaging them. To get the door off the unit, there are four screws on the top of the dryer lid, as well as two on the dryer lint filter, and then one where the door switch is. All seven screws need removed from the door to remove it. Additionally, there are two metal tabs that help keep the door on, and with all the screws removed, you can depress the tab to take the door off. With the door slightly removed, you can attempt to remove the door switch wire harness. However, I had a terrible time with this one, so rather than fight it with limited room, I decided to take the door off by pulling it out and lifting up slowly as not to damage the wiring. Then I placed the door on top of the dryer to have more room to remove the harness, which was much easier. The bulkhead on a Samsung dryer is held on by six screws. Four on the bulkhead itself and two located on the dryer vent housing at the bottom. All six screws need removed before taking the bulkhead off. You'll also need to remove the moisture sensor near the heating element in the lower right corner of the dryer. Once all the screws are removed, you can lift up on the bulkhead to dislodge it from the tabs that hold it on, and then take the bulkhead and blower cover off, revealing the inside of the dryer itself. From here, you'll reach in and unattach the pulley from the belt. Here's what it would look like on the inside of a Samsung dryer. If the belt is still intact on the drum, you can use it to lift the drum up and then forward out of the cabinet. The cabinet has cutouts on each side so the drum can be removed pretty quickly. Here's the inside of this specific Samsung dryer. When you're working on the element or heating system, one of the most important things you can do is clean out the lint as many times it's a major culprit of a dead heating system. Either it has caused it on this one or could cause it in the future. We're going to replace every component in this unit's heating system. So make sure you have all your components handy, but if you're watching this and don't have the components bought yet, make sure to look in the description to purchase this from the video's sponsor. The first thing that we want to do is inspect the heating element and look for visible damage and then get a picture of how the wiring is done on this unit for reference before the connectors are unplugged. We are going to set the multimeter to continuity and check and see if we can get a signal on the heating element, thermostat, and high limit thermostat one by one. To do this, we need to remove one connector from each of the items to ensure that we are getting a good result from the sensor. If you have trouble getting off a connector like I did in the video, you can either use a flathead screwdriver or a pair of needle nose pliers. Sometimes they do not want to come off, but make sure the spade terminal isn't damaged on either the female or male sides of the connector as you take it off. To test these components, turn your multimeter on to a continuity setting 
or you can use an ohms resistance setting. When testing the heating element, you should get continuity in about 10 ohms of resistance if the heater is good when you touch the multimeter to both spade terminals simultaneously. We can also check to see if the element is heating up the metal canister too by putting the multimeter lead to either spade terminal, then the other one to the canister itself. If you get continuity or any active current, it means that the element is grounding out to the canister, which means the element is severed and needs replaced immediately. Next, we're doing the same test on the high limit thermostat or the thermal cutoff. We're looking only for the meter to report continuity. If it's dead, make sure to replace both it and the thermostat because it's possible the thermostat is reporting a false positive and overfeeding the unit heat, causing the thermal cutoff to die. To replace the element, you'll need to take a Phillips head screwdriver and remove two screws holding the element housing in place, one on the top and another on the front of the canister. You'll also need to take off all the sensors off of the canister as well. Depending if you're just replacing the element or element and sensors, you may want to unplug everything or simply unscrew the thermostat and thermal cutoff before taking the element out. There are approximately eight screws on the heating element canister that need removed before the element can be exposed to remove it from the can. Once the element is removed, you'll need to remove the element spades in order to finally remove the element. They're very tiny metal pieces that need flattened on both terminals in order to actually get the element out of the canister and the ceramic housing. You will need a pair of needle nose pliers to do it, and once you flatten them out, the element easily comes out like this. Installing the new element requires you to do the exact same process in reverse. You'll set the element in the canister, thread the terminals onto the block. Also, you'll need to note the orientation of the element wires to install the element wire, ensuring it's not on the wrong post of the ceramic block. I did unscrew the ceramic block off camera and reinstalled it on camera, but you don't really need to touch the block unless it was damaged in some way. You'll thread the element terminals onto the block and then crimp them the same way you took them off. Crimping the terminals on is a rather delicate process and it wasn't made any easier by doing it on camera. Both sides of the terminal will need bent, although the factory element looked like only one side was bent. You'll then reinstall the screws on the canister. Sadly, I did this off camera due to how much time was consumed trying to get the clamshell of the canister on to match with the screw holes of the element itself. The canister has a really thin metal, so you may need to bend it slightly to get it to match. It wasn't necessarily hard, but it took a few minutes before it was ready to put back into the dryer, and it did result in me fumbling around with it a lot off camera. You will install the canister the same way you took it off, and in this video I decided to install the new sensors once the canister was on, but you may prefer to do it with the canister off. Only two screws hold the thermal cutoff, and thermostat on the unit. Make sure to match the wires up properly like we saw earlier in the video. So if you have a picture, make sure you use it. Or you can use this video as a reference because I know it ended up working. The thermistor and thermal fuse are located directly behind the blower housing and beside the motor and idler pulley. The thermistor helps the dryer know what temperature the blower is set at, while the fuse will blow in case it ever overheats, shutting the entire dryer down. Both are pretty easy to take out and in the case of this unit held on only by one screw. The thermal fuse, which is the smallest sensor on the dryer, uses a simple continuity test. Any resistance value shows that the unit is good. If it's bad, there won't be a value given and you'll get an open line on your multimeter, showing that it is bad. Our multimeter shows that this one is perfectly fine. Unlike every other sensor, the black thermistor has a dynamic range of resistance on the multimeter, depending on the temperature. At an ambient temperature of around 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius, the thermistor should yield a result of around 12K ohms. The resistance goes up if it's colder and down if it's warmer. Roughly, you should expect a result of anywhere from 14K to 10K depending on the temperature. Any higher or lower and it's faulty and needs replaced. You can see here that this one ranged between 13 and almost 14 depending on which one I'm using, showing that both are pretty much good. With all sensors checking out good or replaced, we can install the last two sensors and then begin the task of putting the unit back together. We're going to use the belt to put the drum back into the unit and then set it on the rear bulkhead. Once that is done, the belt will need threaded back onto the motor. Then you can use the idler pulley. We'll put the belt onto the pulley to give it tension like shown in this clip. Once done, you can slowly rotate the drum with the door off to ensure that the belt is threaded on properly and the blower will move while the drum turns.
We'll put the bulkhead back on the unit, and you're going to need to make sure that the tabs of the bulkhead go on properly before beginning to put the screws back onto the unit because sometimes the casing on this type can shift. Also, don't forget to install the moisture sensor harness while putting the six screws back into the bulkhead. Getting the bulkhead to fit on just right may take a few adjustments between the tabs and screws, so I had to speed this part up a bit as I needed to make quite a few adjustments given how much I had to tear this unit apart for the videos. Now you will put the door back on. First off, don't forget the door switch harness that was a real pain earlier in the video. You'll slot the bottom of the door onto the metal hinges that hold the door in place at the bottom. Then you'll go ahead and reinstall the seven screws that hold the door to the bulkhead and the dryer cabinet. You also need to make sure that you position the metal retention clips properly, but it's not too hard to line them all up and make the door installation go really, really fast. Now we have to simply drop the lid and make sure it sits properly on the plastic posts for it to lock into place, and now we're all done. We just have to plug the unit back in and wait for the moment of truth. Now, if you've gone through all of this and you're still not finding heat on the unit, despite replacing every single sensor and wiring everything correctly, you've narrowed down to only a few other things that could be wrong with this type of dryer, or if it's a front load, Samsung as well. It's either going to be the control board relay, which you can test with a multimeter, but this is YouTube and I don't want the liability, so get a tech to do it, because it re requires you to deal with live voltage. The other thing it could be would be your motor and its centrifugal switch. It's possible that the motor is causing some problems and you would have to replace the motor to deal with it or possibly a wire that has been severed. Make sure to check all the connections everywhere in the unit and if that doesn't help, get a new dryer, unfortunately. So have a great day. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys.